Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Claudio. On behalf of Art Basel, I'd like to welcome you to this morning's conversation series. Um, it's entitled uh, Collecting New Media, and it's uh, within a series that we call Collectors Focus. This series has um, taken place in uh, previous years as well. We've been looking at um, politics and patronage. Uh, we've been looking at the collector as a producer, and um, this morning we have uh, these distinguished guests here that will talk about how um, the challenges and uh, the risk of, and also the opportunities of how to collect uh, new media. And I um, especially want to thank um, Alice and Steve and Ala and Carl for being here, and I uh, hope we have an interesting discussion. Thank you. Thank you for being here early this morning. My name is Alice Gray Stites. I'm the chief curator of 21C Museum based in Louisville, Kentucky. It is in uh, the heart of the 21C Museum hotels, which are now in Louisville, Kentucky, Cincinnati, Ohio, um, and in Bentonville, Arkansas. So it's uh, dedicated to the art of the 21st century, which I think is supposed to make me qualified to <laughs> moderate this discussion. Uh, so I, I'm lucky that I'm joined this morning by some real leaders on this new frontier. Uh, Steve Sachs has been championing this art form and these artists since opening Bitforms Gallery in New York City in 2001. And we also have here two dedicated and visionary collectors, Alain Servé of Brussels and Carl Thoma from Chicago. We'd all like to thank Art Basel for organizing this conversation this morning and note that it is a real um, mark of prescience to be organizing discussions this year around topics such as new media, and tomorrow's uh, conversation, which I would encourage people to come listen to, The Artist is Farmer. These, um, these are art forms that are interdisciplinary, that are really innovative, and are not necessarily object-based or, or um, perhaps um, open to uh, the conventional forms of commodification. So I think this is real evidence of Art Basel acknowledging the broader changes happening not only in the art world, but in the, uh, the rest of the world as well, and evolving from um, not just a commercial venue, but also a, a platform and a catalyst. So this is very exciting, and we're glad to be here. We are going to start by telling you what we're not going to talk about. <laughs> we're not going to talk about terminology. Uh, the phrase new media is inherently problematic because obviously in the not too near future, the new media won't be. Um, and we know that it, with any form of innovation, of course, um, ideas or form predates language. So um, we are going to stick with the title that uh, the, our, the panel organizers gave us, new media and tell you that we are going to be focusing on the new and the now. That is what this panel is passionate about. We are talking about the um, newest kinds of technology-based art, whether you want to call it interactive, web-based, software-generated, video mapping. What we're not talking about is traditional video art. That will certainly be a point of reference if people have questions and want to use that as a touchstone, very open to that. But since it's been around for decades, um, we'd like to say we're really looking at uh, the new. So um, that said, I'm going to contradict myself right away and say we're going to historicize why we're here. I'd like to begin by uh, asking Alain to contextualize our discussion um, and start us off. Mm -hmm. um, I started looking at uh, new media art about um, probably eight years ago uh, when going to museums uh, a lot and when I started understanding having not, not the background of art history, how important it was to understand that every movement, every development in the art history is always linked to the socio-economical um, context in which it was happening. 
um, I understood and realized that the Impressionists would not have existed if um, the Industrial Revolution didn't happen, uh, introducing a total change in the, in the approach of speeds, uh, working inside, um, and also the social, the, the, the social um, hierarchy of the society. I realized that there would not have been uh, any Dadaist movement if that would not have been the First World War. There would not have been the Surrealist if uh, you didn't have the theory of dreams of uh, Freud. I realized that there would not have been the pop art if we didn't have the, um, the, uh, the start of the consumption society just after the Second World War, and so on, and so on, and so on. So I started looking at uh, today's society, and I really asked myself, you know, what will we remember in 50 years' time? And for me, there's no doubt that um, the vast introduction and the, the, the vast changes that happened with the introduction of uh, computers, internet, uh, we don't even remember when we first, um, not even Google, but Yahoo uh, a long time ago. Uh, but that will be something that artists will remember. So when I discovered that there were artists working in this media uh, for a very long time and in a very per pertinent way, I thought, okay, this will be um, the, the thing of the future, the art of today that will be remembered. It is difficult to collect, which is also in line with what happened in the past. So I said, well, okay, maybe it's the right thing to focus and maybe to help uh, preserving. Carl, how, how, did you, how did you start? Were you interested in how difficult it would be? <laughs> <laughs> I came at it perhaps in a... I internalize it as more of an evolutionary process. My wife and I started collecting art, you know, 35 years ago, and you start out with landscapes, representational art, then you move into more post-war abstract art, and then ended up in the, what's called a color field, which, you know, the artists that define that are the Albers, uh, Frankenthalers, Gene Davis, uh, Lawrence, Morris Lewis, Nolan, but out of that, then caused me to move into, well, I know we're not supposed to talk about, you know, terminology today, but into, you know, light and space art, which we think of Dan Flavin as a leader in that, but it's hard to believe that he started doing that 60 years ago. <clears throat> and then that evolved into looking at some artists like Lil Real, who was starting to use processing to create light and space, and then that led me into what you can either call interactive or, or process art which is where you're starting to use a lot of, you know, processors and technology software to generate, you know, <coughs> visual images. But what I find somewhat interesting, and maybe now I feel like I've finally, finally found home, is I, myself and Dick Kramlich, which most people know is a real leader in the video space, started out in the venture capital business together, you know, 40 years ago. So we were there when the Bob Noises and others were creating microprocessors and chips, which led to the apples and, and where we are today. So it's, you know, kind of fun in my own career, you know, 40 years later to have evolved where how I make a living crosses paths with now my favorite kind of art to collect because I'm totally convinced this field will define the 21st century. So you are seeing, you, you have a comfort level with this kind of art because you are familiar with how it is made in a sense. And the, the technology was something that was already part of your, your, your working vocabulary. Um, and I think one thing we'd like to address is how do we, how, how do other people enter into this field of supporting, collecting, commissioning, working with these artists? Steve, as a, a conduit <laughs> between these different parties, um, how, do you, how do you work your role? How do, how do you do that? Well, first I want to address a little bit, um, again, what some of these new processes are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think since I've had the gallery, I would say the most interesting development has been uh, much more uh, of a devotion to using code or computers in the development of these pieces. And I think that is the innovation that we'll be talking about a lot here. But also code brings issues, and code brings different levels of criteria that an artist needs to pay attention to, that a collector needs to be aware of. Um, code is a living, breathing thing. It's, it's alive. And the code is also connected to a machine, which also has to be mm -hmm. managed. And 
I really, it's, it's necessary, it's still always about the idea, it's still about the concept, is this idea inherently strong for the artist? But the, the machine and the code and how these pieces are actually being created is, it's necessary for a collector to have some comprehension of that. Um, because, uh, I mean, I don't like to say this, of course, as a dealer, but these machines will break. You know, the code will have to be addressed at some point. But the excitement about the work, the reason the work is innovative for today is because of those elements. Um, so, I mean, we could talk a little bit about how collectors can deal with that. Um, but I think it's important to, to start off in that area. Mm -hmm. Well, um, but I think too, you know, we can talk, you can talk about code, but the reason that usually um, audiences, viewers, collectors are drawn to these works is because of the metaphor and the meaning in, in them, and, 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 and not simply that it's a, um, a, something new and, and now, there are, um, it, it's still art and there are qualities about um, these Absolutely. pieces that, that, we, that we would also describe a, a, a painting or a sculpture or an installation in the same way. It, it, it changes your mind about something. It gives you a new perspective on the world. It's reflective of how we live and learn. Yeah, yeah. And, that's and, first and, and dream. foremost. So, um, that's obviously, yeah, definitely. Uh, tell, it, it, tell us maybe a bit about um, some of the ways in which you're, dr what you're drawn to in new media. Yeah. So. First of all, is the quality of the art. You know, this is art, and the definition of you, I use of art is the one that I heard um, Mera Rubel quoting once, and she, I'm sure she invented herself, which is, art is a language, which means an exchange between different people, uh, which opens your heart because the, the response is very emotional sometimes, not only uh, purely intellectual. Uh, to the other with a big O, uh, the other being any way of other way of thinking, other ways of living, other ways of, of, of behaving, and so on. So it is art um, originally. Then, of course, you've got to think about, and it depends also, also to the collectors. But in my case, um, you know, I was listening to uh, Chris Dercon in Zurich uh, last Sunday. He said that um, uh, a museum is um, is a center of accumulation of memory. Mm -hmm. um, and it is true, and I believe this uh, very strongly. Uh, I'm, I'm not collecting for today. I think like, um, like um, Carl mentioned, uh, talking about the Kremlich, uh, who did a fantastic job from that point of view, it's about preserving the present for mm -hmm. the future. And immediately you're touching the, the, the new media arts, of course you are questioning uh, how to do it. Um, and, and definitely there are problems. I mean, uh, Steve sent us an article appearing in the New York Times a couple of days ago about problems faced by the Whitney Museum. Uh, for, and so it is an inherent problem uh, to it. So the way I approach it is, of course, I'm talking to the dealers, and if I find someone in front of me that doesn't understand the problematic and is not ready to help me, I will tend to... Uh, either move away or try to s go or, or, or make an understanding with the, the artist himself. So for me, the key base of, of this is, first of all, to, for both parties to understand what their rights and duties are vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. the work. Second part, which is extremely important, which is also the same, uh, you, you mentioned um, Flavin or, or uh, Carl, you mentioned Flavin and other kind of, um, uh, of ephemeral works is to have a proper documentation by the artist. I mean, to describe in the most detail possible uh, what are his intention. Mm -hmm. That means how can those intentions be reproduced in the future um, if the technology has changed? Would you have accepted, um, I don't know, other type of neon, or LCD in the case of Flavin, or you know, what kind of support if suddenly computers are not in our, our desk anymore, but are in our brain straight away? So I don't know what will happen, but you know, when I was um, in the Kutz Museum uh, two days ago, I was looking at the Holbein, and I find so amazing that we're still able to look at those works uh, created 600 years ago, and that looks to have been made yesterday. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a it is a very essential um, uh, question. It needs to be addressed uh, by, um, by the galleries, uh, for sure. Um, and also to be understood by the artists themselves at the time they are creating the work. 
because I think um, it is the key for a real uh, um, acceptance of, um, of this new media uh, by collecting by the collectors and institutions. And there are definitely solutions, and we'll, we'll come to this maybe yeah. later, yeah. but there are definitely um, ideas or ways, and certainly that started with video, that but can be extended to new media as well. That prioritizing of the artist's intent um, is very important. It's something that defines the way that um, I operate within the museum as an, as an institution. You're often working with younger artists, which means that it's much easier to have those conversations and to help them um, define what their intentions are and understand what you can do um, in the future. I think it leads to a new kind of relationship um, between artists and dealers, between artists and collectors, between artists and curators, that you, you really have to communicate and have a relationship, um, which I think is an exciting thing to be doing. Um, have you found th this, Carl, when you're, have you, have you commissioned specific pieces for your collection or in other ways worked closely with the artists when you, in, when you install them? Or I guess I'll make a couple of observations. Is I generally do not believe in <clears throat> commissioning art because to me what makes art special to me is to get an insight into the artist is how they look at, at the world and want to process information and then, and then give it back. And, and a lot of, to me, one of the nice features of, of the art, most of us are collecting. A lot of these artists do large public installations. And so some of the pieces we may be fortunate enough to own are almost precursors to a bigger installation. And so I, I have a real kind of a strong bias that you should not commission art because I <laughs> I don't know. I, it just, it just, I think you agree, at least some of your interviews. I, it's just a personal bias. But I do agree that one of the fun thing is, because I'm collecting, you know, younger is always a relative term, <laughs> is these are, are bright, innovative people. And a lot of them have been trained as programmers, have got degrees in that space. So, so my feeling is they do a nice job of, of documenting their code and explaining what's going on. And at least for me, because I've only been collecting this field five years, we're, we're dealing with a lot of newer technology than if you went back 20 or 30 years ago. You know, these LEDs will, a lot of them burn up to 30,000 hours, unless you're in a public museum, you know, that's a, you know, and that's a number of years. You know, it's all solid state, it's, it's not analog code, so it, it makes it easier, but it's nice to work with the artist because, you know, I thought a great example is I had a piece that was taking a analog feed where it would take the television image and capture the main color in it and then create other images out of it. It was for analog television and then when everything went digital, he went and got with the artist and you know, you know, two or three months later he had rewritten the code to, to handle with, with digital art. So I mean I think that's the nice part, at least getting in the field today. You're probably dealing, as she said, you're going to deal with younger artists, it's going to help you get more comfortable as to kind of embracing this, that you're not taking the risk you might think you're taking. Mm. Just, think, just jumping yeah. on the little remark about young artists, what I found fascinating when approaching this is that I didn't realize, like Manfred Moore, for example, shown by Steve here uh, at the fair, or other artists I've, I've been collecting, like Mark Napier, Christophe Bruno in France, um, they've been working in this field for like 10 years, mm. you know. Mm. I don't think I could even uh, log in on internet 10 years ago or something <laughs> like that. So um, what I mean by this is it is not something, a fad that has been uh, created last year. It is some, some people have been working in there almost since, like for video, since mm -hmm. the, 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 the new media existed, they thought, okay, I, I want to express something. And I think we could also add that the key thing is not to use the media, we talked uh, with Alice about, about this, um, it's not to use the media as a, as a toy or to replicate other forms of, of art. I mean, you, you could do painting with computers, you know, is it really adding anything? I don't know, but they are really a new language. Um, and then some, some artists uh, I have the chance of collecting, like Martin Napier and others, are, are really using the, the computer to create a, a, a message or something an expression. So there are young artists, but don't that young anymore. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I th I really respect um, your perspective on 
uh, commissioning versus acquisition, and that you don't you know don't want to to go into any kind of murky territory where you're dictating or telling someone what um, an artist what to do. But I I would point out that because um, the audience and the support for new media has been more limited that um, often there are artists for whom um, the commission is, is, is what um, inspires them to actually make important work that without, and this is obviously from an institutional perspective where um, it makes sense to, to commission works. I mean, at, at 21C, we have um, in our spaces a number of seven, seven to eight commission projects um, in each one, and, and, and that's, um, it's a different, um, function than a private collection, but at the same time, I do think that it's an, it's an important aspect yeah. of, of this field because uh, you can challenge um, a young artist who has the tools, who has the ideas, who has the vision, but, but not perhaps the, the opportunity. Well, I have actually a, a good example. The National Portrait Gallery just mm -hmm. commissioned Luc Dubois one of my artists to do a portrait of the Google founders. And of course, the Google founders, uh, they're, they're some of the most innovative uh, pioneers in our generation. And Luke wanted to tap into that conceptually. And he wanted to tap into the essence of what Google was. So he actually, everything he did uh, connected to videos that he found of them speaking online. And their, their language then became instant searches on Google. So basically, this, this work is covering a, a range of media that we're mm -hmm. talking about right now. It's dealing with uh, found footage on the internet. It's dealing with interpreting that found footage using code and, and then releasing that in a two-channel piece. Um, and the NPG is very specific about how, how, what are they getting? Like, what are they really getting? And they're actually, there's a whole, there are a number of different steps that were involved. And um, they, of course, get the code. Mm -hmm. um, they get the, the backup of that code. But not only that, they wanted an emulation of the experience because they didn't want to have to interpret that in the future. So Luke actually made a three-hour compressed video of what a slice of this piece would be if it wasn't live accessing the internet. Um, so that was great because that museum is starting to think about how to preserve, how to collect, and how to manage these different elements within these, these type of commissions. I think they must also really like Google because they also commissioned, uh, it, I don't know if anyone <laughs> else is that familiar with Lincoln Schatz's uh, yeah, yeah, I, I should. Yeah, yeah, Conversation. Yeah. Well, we're we're going to be showing yeah, that yeah. at Twenty One C Cincinnati um, yeah. later this summer. It's the generative yeah, yeah. portraits of um, well, they're leaders in politics and and innovation. Yeah. It's it's a wonderful piece, but that's an interesting yeah, yeah. Uh, connection. It, it's true that it it is a quantum leap to um, to start collecting new media because I remember one of the first pieces I bought um, a while ago. Um, when I got uh, delivery of the piece by Ronna Hoffman in Chicago, um, it was a piece by Sebrand Verstake, I'm sure you're from Chicago, you must mm -hmm. uh, know him well. And I, I got a computer. Uh, so, you know, you go back home, I travel back home to <coughs> Belgium with a computer, and that was my work of art. Which, <coughs> when people look at me at the airport, they said, usually I was coming back with kind of paintings and things, and they say, yeah, that's my new work of art, and the, the, the code was loaded in there. So, of course, it's, it's a change from the usual uh, two-dimensional painting, <laughs> um, but it's, that's a leap uh, I think you have to do to, um, yeah, to stay in tune. But the value is an experiential one. It's not an sure. object-based one, yeah, even though your exactly. experience what, it can just also be visual and aesthetic. It's, yeah. Just to visualize the difference there is between buying a painting or by new media art, it's different. Right, and so maybe sometimes you might even just download your new work of art. <laughs> yeah, what, what, what I did is not to multiply the screen, is that I had another artist, and based on that computer, I asked both artists if it was okay to load both works That's on right. the same computer. Point. Yeah. Uh, because the computer was there, it was used for a very little thing, so rather than having multiple screens, I, I, um, 
Uh, you can rotate. Yeah. I just I just press you. press thing and uh, I move from one from Cibran Verstig to Christo Bruno uh, follow according to my my mood or my taste or whatever mm. I want to show it. So there are possibilities for adaptation to, to this kind of the technology. But you have yeah. to ask yourself um, as, as a collector or as a curator when you're presenting, when you're doing something like that, would I do this same process were it another art form? You know, keeping that standard of, of presentation and respect for the artist's intent um, consistent across <coughs> media. Carl, how do you uh, dis how, how do you display your work, or how do you in engage with showing it in, in your home, or maybe in other maybe uh, if I, I don't know if you have spaces to share it with the public. I would say right now, none of my art's broke yet, so I'm not worried about it. <laughs> my bigger worry is finding space to uh, display mm -hmm. it because this art, unfortunately, or fortunately, takes a lot of space, so. While we have a, a warehouse, we're, it's not big enough, and believe it or not, it's not easy to find 20,000 square foot buildings in Chicago that will, you know, be pleasant and display art. You know, you'd think it would be easy, but it's, it's not. So, unfortunately, about 80% of it is uh, still in crates because most of it, a lot of it is too big to really install in your, in your home. So that, but, but I'm working really hard to find a building. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I don't know if we want to open for, uh, we actually, before we open it up, and we do want to open it up for questions, um, we've talked about some of the challenges. Um, we'd also like to start talking about solutions. If, uh, because challenges are opportunities and problems are solutions. Uh, so we started a very interesting conversation about this last night, about whether it would be possible that one solution of taking away some of the barriers to entry into the market for new media um, would be greater transparency and accessibility, a kind of creating standards for new media art um, that, so that people will be better aware of what is available, how do I acquire it, how do I take care of it, and what am I getting? Um, Alan, you have some specific ideas about what does... Standardization sounds, again, uh, getting in trouble with language. Um, it's a feeling that cre a, a standard means, means, means a protocol that could actually foster more creativity more art. More efficient preservation. More yeah. efficient. Okay. Yeah. So maybe you want to start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, like I, said, you, yeah. I mean, I could speak to it a little bit. Um, again, this, this project with the NPG, we, we've also uh, sold work to other museums. And actually, um, a lot of the museums have helped a lot with standardizations um, uh, in terms of giving very specific questions the artist has to answer. Again, this idea of emulation, which uh, again, mm -hmm. uh, Alice had mentioned this article in the New York Times about the Whitney, uh, which was very, is very relevant to this discussion. Uh, it was a very early web-based piece by Douglas Davis. It was uh, called, I think, the world's longest uh, collaborative sentence or something like that. Um, and the, the, this was a web-based project done in 1995. And of course, everything has changed. Even the experience with the internet and how someone is, is uh, interfacing has changed. So the Whitney made a very interesting decision where they chose to restore the old code and the old artwork as it were, even if it had some quirky elements to it. But then based on the conceptual uh, foundation of the work, they actually created a new piece that was connected to the idea the code was just updated and then we'll live on for another X amount of years. Um, so Alan is going to speak about it as well, but these standards uh, are essential to preserving this work in terms of knowing uh, the, co the code that was used, the foundation of the work, which is basically allowing for the collector and the curator and the people to experience it. Um, also visually how it's experienced and um, how the work is presented. If it's a screen-based work, does it, like a Manfred Moore work, have to be on a 20-inch screen mm -hmm. as an intimate experience? 
versus a 60-inch screen. And um, these are all things, if there's some level of standardization, will allow for people to collect it easier, to preserve it, to enjoy it um, over a much longer period of time. Yeah, I mean, we, uh, at 21C, you know, we've, we collect all, all different media, both analog uh, and new, and I've, we've learned a lot. It's a steep learning curve, um, but keeping really good records of how each project is done, and each one is inherently different. Uh, I'm thinking recently of a wonderful interactive uh, project with an artist named Brian Kneff, who is mm. artist in residence at Harvard Medical School, and it, um, it, it's, he rewrote the code kind of halfway through because to make it easier for us to adjust, for my team to, uh, to work with the piece, um, which is fantastic, but we have to keep very close records. And, and you know, um, people like Manfred Moore, I think in, we just installed a piece by Ori Gersh. He's mm -hmm. the same way, he's very specific about um, the kind of screen, the kind of frame. Um, but is there a way to pool together all of this information from collectors and institutions uh, in some kind of structure or clearinghouse for, for information that, that would be helpful for artists as well as, as collectors. Uh, Alain, you had an example of yeah, how this was happening. I, again, I'm, I'm a little bit of a fan of history because I think you learn a lot by looking at history. And history has always shown that um, a progress, a new an innovation, um, gets really is wide um, effects on, on economy or society when it's adopted widely and it's got standardized in one way or another. I think that's, that will be the <coughs> same with new media art because, of course, as a collector, do I want to negotiate a, con a different contract with every gallery or artist I'm going to work with? Of course, I, I don't want to do that. Um, do I, will I have to discuss different conditions, make accept different conditions? No. The same way as, you know, I'd, I'd rather use a standard contract for renting an apartment or any way to use it as a base. Uh, I can adapt it with specificities linked to the work, but I prefer to work with a, a common accepted standard. So I think one of the first essential things that, uh, that the art community, the gallery community, and the artist community, uh, and also the collectors should push for it, is to agree on a sort of frame, uh, you know, it can be flexible and pretty wide, but of the kind of rights and duties that are coming with this kind of arts. And it should be agreed from the beginning and giving a, a certain type of standard. To get to that level, uh, definitely we spoke about documentation. Documentation would be essential part mm -hmm. of it and should be almost part of the piece uh, when it's uh, delivered, not later when there is a problem or whatever. Mm -hmm. Because let's not forget uh, as well that um, you know, we are all, we've got a, a limited, limited time on this earth. Yeah. Whether the galleries, whether the artists, yeah. and whether the collectors as well. And, you know, we have to make sure that it can be, again, uh, transmitted to, uh, to another way. You have so to think about legacy. I'm yeah. using just yeah. about preserving. It's mm -hmm. not legacy. No, it's the, just of the piece, of the work yeah, itself. Uh, yeah. You know, yeah. um, and I see then different examples. So I think the standard contract, the documentation, should be now best practices by all people involved. And there should be kind of a professional gathering between collectors, museum, art galleries, rep representative galleries, artists, to discuss you know, the problematic around it, to try to get to a, a standard. Um, and you know, we, we talked about it briefly, I think yesterday, about the, the mid-galleries level. You know, the art market, art world, hopefully still, um, is becoming a little bit of an industry right now. And, you know, we cannot work with single galleries with different frame of mind and, and so on. We need to, if we want to broaden the appeal to make it more comfortable for, um, for collectors to, to get involved or museums, um, we, we need to make it easier. And I would just like to finish with uh, mentioning an example that for me is remarkable because that preservation problem is really key in video for sure. There are two centers of excellence in the world about preservation of video, mm -hmm. which are the Getty Museum and the Tate Modern, with really developed um, competencies in that field. In Europe, we, we developed the very impressive and interesting um, project called Europeana, mm -hmm. and I really strongly advise you to have a look at it, which initially was the idea of backing up 
all the Cinematec uh, that were owned by the different countries. And I think, if I read well, there are now 2,000 institutions who are providing digital um, uh, copies of their work, which will then be available on internet to most of the public for free. Um, so that means that the, the infrastructure behind it is absolutely gigantic. And you know, rather than sometimes building something, it's the same with the video, video um, arts uh, mm -hmm. markets. Rather than building your little thing, your little uh, chalet Swiss in the, in the mountain, um, you know, try to, to come on a big, on a big whale. Yeah. And it would be very easy to uh, arrange with Europeana to do the backup. Yeah, and you would have a certificate of the work by, initiated by the artist, and you would need another copy in five years, 10 years, 100 years, 200 years' time, then you don't need any galleries, nothing anymore. So it, there are solutions, there are possibilities. There will be, you know, there are people starting to back up the internet uh, in images. So why not to plug um, the, um, the new media arts market to this kind of field? They are still very tentative, but. That, those are the kind of reflections that are, I think, necessary to make sure that we can collect new media arts um, still more or less comfortably, if, even if we know that we'll have uh, problems to solve. So led by the artists and what they're doing, every component element in the art world is going to have to evolve um, in order to stay relevant, in order to be part of the conversation, and uh, it's all changing. Um, Steve, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. This, this, this form of art, this new media itself is perhaps changing um, the art market. Yeah. So how does what you do perhaps differ from a more traditional or gallery or how does what, how the way you work now differ from, say, 15 years ago? Assuming you were in the yeah. art business yeah. at such a young age. <laughs> Actually, was in a slightly different business, okay. but connected. Um, yeah, it's. I mean, for me, I started to focus specifically on new media, and, and as we keep talking, this phrase "new media" is strange, but um, it's about how artists are tapping into contemporary tools to create their work, and those tools, uh, obviously, in this day and age, are many times computational. Um, but it's beyond the idea of Photoshop, which is a ubiquitous mm -hmm. tool that everybody's using. It's about how do you utilize that code and create an artistic vision that no one has ever experienced before. And that's what I've always looked for. And that's try, what I try to find in, in the artists I'm looking for. Um, and there's so much more to talk about, even in terms of this idea of preservation. We're just talking about really the screen. These, some of these works, like your in, interactive installations, yeah. Uh, from Raphael Lozano Hemmer, etc., um, uh, are dealing with a number of levels of moving parts, uh, code, etc. So, again, it comes down to the artist being very aware at an early stage that this is something that uh, it, uh, you know, your average person just can't uh, preserve. You need to have uh, information. The artist needs to, not only just information about the, the technology, but again, the concept the emulation, the experience, the scale, all of this stuff is crucial and has to be gathered at an early stage. Right, but that, what I'm saying is that means that your role, your role as a gallerist it is now... You I'm a talk collaborator about, on yeah, that. And, yeah, and you're a connector between the artist and the people who would like to acquire the art. And you, It's a longer, probably, it's, it's a sort of a constant conversation, I would imagine, rather than you like this piece, I'm so glad, yes, come back. You know, yes, the next show. Yes. And there's also you have to um, change, your role is, has changed because of the nature of the art. Yeah, in many cases, that, that's the case, absolutely. So, and yes. Come I on. might add one comment that for, for any of you thinking about starting to collect this type of art is don't let all this discussion about standards scare you from doing it because it starts first with the passion and mm -hmm. throughout the world. We know we're innovative and we'll come up with solutions to come back and you think about people restoring cars by going to machine shops and recreating transmissions because you can't buy them anymore. The conservators of this medium will rise when it gets deep enough and it, and now at least if you're buying newer artists because the technology's evolved a lot, it's, 
it's a lot more stable and, and the worst thing we can do about this whole type of uh, whatever we want to call it is don't get intimidated by worrying about standards and it won't work three or four years from now is you know if you're going to be an innovator there's some risk when you you get involved but i'm confident that our quote our industry if it is such you know will will we'll keep this art working just like you know the whitney got that pieces of internet art yeah. to work mm -hmm. Absolutely. you know it's not the end of the world they had to spend some money to restore <laughs> you know that's maybe that's what makes it special yeah. is it, it it is outgrown but you come back and you revitalize it. People love to buy old cars and restore them. It's just a hobby and a passion. Yep. Yeah, it makes it fun. You do learn things you, you didn't expect. Last week, um, we were actually trying to replace plastic blades of grass um, on a beautiful interactive piece by a San Francisco artist named Ryan Wolf. It's um, at, at, at 21C, and it's a, it, this is a piece that each blade of grass has a microprocessor chip and they're all, they all talk to each other beginning with the one at the nearest the window that takes in atmospheric data from the outside and then transmits it across the field of grass um, to emulate the wind related to the, the actual environment. But a couple of the plastic blades didn't work and replacing those was sound simple, it was more complicated but also fascinating. Um, and it, it leads to a deeper understanding of the work from the perspective of a curator it allows me to communicate hopefully better to the public why this is an interesting work of art. It actually has a great deal to do with memory um, and the way our minds remember physical experiences of nature um, and store those the way that you, you know your mind stores those experiences in many ways the way a computer um, stores information. So it's exciting to learn things you never thought you would. Um, I mean, that's always true about art, but especially, I think, mm. in the field of new media. Um, so I need to check on how much time we have. 45. So I think we should open it up for questions. <laughs> yes. I um, just, just want to let you know that this, uh, the video will go online uh, with the help of our partner, the Absolute Art Bureau. So if you could please introduce yourself with your name. My name is Lillian Stitcher. <laughs> That's all. It's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't um, have to sign anything, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> I don't worry, I just want to be as, uh, as it should be. <laughs> okay, my, my question is about authentication of this kind of artwork. Authentication, you said? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, authenticity. Yeah. Authenticity. Authenticity, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, there's a few things that, that happen. There, there's a very <laughs> old school method, which is a piece of paper uh, and a certificate and a signature, which is quite important, actually. Um, and on that piece of paper also typically has information about the work and what's included in it. Um, but the code, of course, needs to be uh, protected by the collector, in a sense, if it's a code-based work. Um, Usually you get two versions of a piece. You have kind of a play version that you would actually present, and then you would have a backup version which gets stored and, again, should be protected. And also, not only should be protected, it should not be forgotten. <laughs> because if you put something away, any, even some of these things that say they're 100 years of life, you still need to go back and make sure it, it's functional. Sometimes you even need, like, in other words, if you bought a VHS tape, as a and there's a backup of VHS tape, and all of a sudden there are no more VHS tapes 20 yeah. years later, you need to consider what the next generation is. And, and what I mean by you, it's a lot of times it's the collector's responsibility to stay on top of that. Um, so between the paper and the, the, uh, the two different items of pa backup and play, um, that's really what someone's getting, and that's really the, authentic, the authenticity of this kind of, kind of work. If you have anything. With somebody in the middle? Yeah. Hi, I'm Hugo Wheeler, and I was just wondering, um, what do you do about pricing and sort of marketing new media pieces? So, pricing. pricing and marketing new media pieces. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Do you I, I was going to ask Stephen, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's, it's like any art. It, it, mm -hmm. It's a difficult question to answer. It, there's, there's no... Uh, obviously, the, the history of the artist, the, um, the depth of the work, uh, in many cases, it, 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 the uniqueness of the work. And it also, actually, another thing which does come into play is the production expenses. And some of these works that are, uh, again, beyond the screen are quite costly, sometimes tens of thousands of dollars to produce. So um, that has to, has to go into the calculation when you're doing pricing. Um, but yeah, it's just like anything. If it's a younger artist who doesn't have a lot of experience, the pricing is going to be at a lower level. As they mature and they have a bigger body of work, it's going to increase. But in terms of what I've seen in 10 years, they've absolutely increased uh, many, many percentages. And I see it uh, also much a wider audience where there's a lot uh, less expensive work that can be acquired. Yeah, just uh, oh, okay. Okay, please. I don't know, one nice thing to me about art being more affordable in this field is the vast majority of this will be produced in a series of like three pieces, maybe six. And because of that, you know, I guess the collector gets a little bit more, I think, you know, gets, gets more, more value versus where you're making a single oil on canvas and, and then, you know, two people want it and they want to pay a jillion dollars for it. Whereas here, I think, that to me, this medium of, of art is still, relatively speaking, very, very affordable. To me, that's the fun part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just um, to speak in terms of, uh, of economics, <laughs> Um, it is a new market, so of course, as Steve said, it's not easy to fix. So there's much more dialogue as well with the collectors and the institutions, uh, for sure. Um, it is true, as Carl was saying, it's a new media, so it's true that we, you know, it's like, you know, I remember just <laughs> side, side where, uh, a, a Musée d'Orsay exhibition uh, where they put um, a big dealer from the turn of the uh, 20th century. Um, I, I think it was whatever. I don't remember which one they were. They were showing in the same exhibition, you know, the Gauguin, the Van Gogh uh, that they were selling, and the kind of the things they were selling at the time. But what's very what's very interesting is that they took the accounting of the of the of the uh, of the, the gallery and they looked at it and they were asked putting the price at which it was sold. So it was very funny how much a nice little landscape, uh, totally um, forgotten artist uh, and totally uninteresting, was selling like, uh, for 500 times more than the Gauguin, which was uh, <laughs> then sold at the back <laughs> things. We are a little bit in this situation in the new media art, because nobody really understands it. Nobody wants to take the risk. So at the moment, as Carl is saying, yes, there are some Sometimes I cannot believe of the quality and the importance of the work and the, the price it is. Unfortunately for the artist, and that's the difficulty uh, of working in this media, let's not hide it. Um, but in, in a way, it is, it is the way it is. Also, there are more dialogues with the, um, with the different partners because, uh, of course, uh, yes, too much. To, uh, of course, there is the, the, uh, the production cost. But, um, yeah, it's not, a, it's not an exact science. It's like... Um, and dialogue is much bigger, and, and uh, we, we can say that on average, um, it, it cannot be so expensive because it's so new in some way. Is it answering your question? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Back here. Hi, uh, my name is Eva Ruiz. Uh, related to the price and to the production, there's always the edition as well, and my question is, uh, what do you think about the addition of three normally that, that galleries put in, in the new uh, well, in the videos? Uh, and uh, you think it should be um, moderated, I mean, uh, put a wider or, or la larger edition in order to low down the price or to even reach more people, which uh, normally cannot afford this? Uh, I think in order should should um, have different uh, types of editioning. Uh, I think it's nice to have small three or six at the most, but I also think they should do large editions that reach a lot of people. In fact, there's quite a few websites uh, that are being developed right now that are selling editions of 1,000, editions of 800 and 500 mm -hmm. for 
And some of these artists are actually quite famous. And I think part of the concept is they're taking advantage of, obviously, the reach of the internet and of this idea of new media. Now, some of these artists are not really necessarily tapping into the tools in a way that I think is, is um, innovative. It's more about utilizing it versus creating new. But I think it's, it's great for these artists not to be afraid of doing large editions, as long as they're doing small ones as well and keeping some of the higher level concepts intact. It, it's really not a debate uh, this morning. It's really a conversation yeah. because we seem to agree on everything, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well. which is despite a different thing. But I think it's a very, very important question. Um, you know, once uh, let's go back to video. Um, you know, there, there's that habit today. There's the standard in the video to say edition of five. Right. Who decided that? I have no idea. <laughs> Why? No idea. Is it a good idea? It is a bre Is it a Enormously stupid idea, <laughs> okay? Uh, but it's absolutely no way to make the galleries think otherwise. And they are the galleries deciding because the artist does not care and does not know. Um, so he's listening to his, his galleries. I think it's, you know, the problem we have to understand, there is an art market uh, with, the, with which we are, we are staying right now. Um, where, of course, there's money and, and everybody money needs to get paid and to maximize the kind of prices. Of course, for a painting, or even we could understand for photography, it makes sense to addition because there's the intervention or a flavin, even if flavin is, would be a good case to discuss, uh, but we won't open this. But the key thing is, okay, when the new media, where the photography or video appeared, and not to talk about this new media we're talking about today, there was a kind of, okay, what can I do? I'm, I'm, I'm talking about an elite group of people that want something unique. They want unique handbags from, uh, from the Kelly handbag, or they want you know, a special edition of an Aston Martin. They want always something special. So to, to, breed that, to feed that kind of people, you need short editions. But I'm sorry, I'm interested in art. And art is not for this elite only, it is for the broader public as well. So me, personally, I really don't care if the thing I own is owned by a thousand people, five people, a hundred million people. For me, as long as they enjoy it and they, they, have, they have to you know, have a, um, an impression, a feeling, they're changing their mind, they're questioning themselves with this work. You know, I'm happy that it, it goes around and around. Obviously, there needs to be a balance because at the moment it's a pretty narrow market, so mm -hmm. you need also to, um, to feed the artist, so you need to find the right balance between those different uh, obligations. But I totally agree with Steve. Uh, there should be short edition. There should be a lot, a lot of large editions. And also then maybe broaden uh, the appeal of the art market, simply. Uh, today, we are in a new world again. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we are you know, feeding, I don't know, maybe 40, 50,000 people that we'll be visiting. It was funny because I was here the two first days of the opening, and I was seeing serious buyers you know, discussing the price. Can I buy a million, two million, three million? And then I came the third day when it was the public, and I called it, oh, those people are buying those work with their camera. Um, because, you know, they don't buy anymore, but they shoot them, and so they appropriate <laughs> them <laughs> in a way, yeah. which is a different story, but, you know, they have, they have right to this art as well. Um, they're the owners of this art as well. So, yes, I'm definitely um, open to wide edition, and I think it's really essential, and also for generally the art market to broaden its appeal to the wider public. Yeah, and, and that's what I think new media, or whatever you want to call it, really can engender is this broadening. Many of these artists are working at new intersections of art and technology, engineering, the medical field. Um, they're involved in, in solving all kinds of problems as well as, as creating art. And I think it's a, a very optimistic moment. Um, so I'm I think we'll just going to yeah. add what Alan said. To me, that's what's so excited about this space, because if we look at how society has developed over time, this reason I do feel it's the art of the 21st century. Because once you've come up with the concept, it's easier to duplicate it than somebody, you know, got to paint the Mona Lisa, you know, 200 times. 
and we can share it with more people because at the end of the day, all of us collect art in this room or up here is because we want to share it with people. It, it creates mm -hmm. a state of mind, it enlightens us, it leads to a better civilization. And to me, this art has that ability to, to reach you know, billions of people. And, and that's the reason I think ultimately when we look back two or 300 years from now, it, it's gonna be somewhat you know, revolutionary if you think about finally getting a medium like television is seen worldwide. Lots of this art can be duplicated and seen worldwide. And, and so I think that's why we're all probably here. That, that's a good thing, because the art that you're talking about isn't just reflecting the way we live now, it's anticipating the future. And to be part of that means to maybe to be, to be part of change. So, um, any more questions? Okay. Thank you all so much for joining us. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Alain. Thank you, Carl. Um, thank you, Art Basel. It's been a very nice discussion. Thank you.